On my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its backs of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon, with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows on stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Ammoner, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart. My sister, my bride, you have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all chief spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink and be drunk with love. I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment, how could I put it on? I had bathed my feet, how could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. 
The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved, that you thus adjure us? My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among ten thousand. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned, that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the bed of spices, to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. He grazes among the lilies. You are beautiful as Tirza, my love. Lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins, not one among them has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed, the queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vines had budded, whether the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsman, a prince. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. Why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? I want to begin with a request uh, and then a correction. The request is this. One of you will have a Bible of mine that is marked up with uh, highlighters and, and so forth. There'll be, it's not a kind of lucky number or anything like that, but uh, I just marked it all up and left it. And so somebody's probably got it in it is some, a poem written by the youth group following the talk last week. It's a haiku. I don't know if you know what I didn't know what a haiku was, but they came up to me afterwards. They made it up during the talk as a summary of last week's talk. You ready? Sex is, mo sex is mostly good, except when it's sometimes bad. So we must guard it. That's a haiku. I just thought you'd be interested to know that. Anyway, here is the correction. The correction is this, uh, that I hope will help us as we explore the rest of uh, the song over the next two weeks. Uh, we just uh, had read to us the scene that depicts the physical consummation of a marriage between a lover and her beloved. Over the centuries, people are eager to avoid the sexual language of the book because they're slightly uptight and retentive, have sought to read out anything physical from it. What we've just had read to us Chapter 3 begins with a nightmare. Chapter 5 goes on into a nightmare. We'll come to that. But the middle piece, chapter 4, 1 through to 5, 1, can only be described as the consummation of the, the marriage. That is the sexual act that confirms, as it were, the marriage. So chapter 4, the lover traces his beloved's body from head to toe. Uh, your eyes, your hair, your teeth, 
your lips, your cheeks, your neck, your breasts, the mountain of myrrh. The lover then describes his beloved as his bride on six occasions. Did you notice that? Verse 8, come away with me, my bride. You've captivated my heart, verse 9, my bride. Verse 10, my sister, my bride. Verse 11, my bride. 12, my bride. And then the consummation, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. And then the beloved invites her lover to consummate the union. I think verse 16 is meant to be the woman rather than the man. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden to eat its choicest fruits. And then he describes and reflects on the union. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk, and then the friends. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. It's not that they're actually in the room or anything as horrible as that, but they're celebrating sexual love. And just try reading sex out of those phrases. And then chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, as she reflects in the past tense, in the nightmare, My beloved put his hand to the latch. My heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved. So here's the correction. You know, I said last week that it's all about sex. Good sex last week, bad sex this week, God and sex next week. But over the course of the week, it was pointed out to me by a couple of the people who help in our training that perhaps... Love would be a better description, and I thought that was really helpful. Close to 50 times, love, or my beloved, is mentioned. Perhaps then we would be better to put it like this. This is a poem about love and sex. And this is a poem about true love, true sexual love. And we're going to see, both this week and next, that this poem aims to restore love, to reinstate love as it actually is meant to be, so that we comprehend and enjoy and benefit from love, whether we're married or not, that as a whole community, as a church family, we understand love. I'll come back to that later and then next week. Now, our method over the three weeks has been to speak about the poem in the way we find it as we read it. And first time through, I think kind of there's no mistaking, unless you really want to kind of read it out of the text, there's a huge amount of sex in the poem. Read it a few more times, you begin to think, well, as as somebody pointed out, you know, it's about more than sex. There's a huge amount of love in the poem. And not all of it is safe, you might say. So what I want us to look at today then is first of all the power of love and then the pain of love and then just very, very briefly the pursuit of love. Let's begin with the power of love. It's a bit of a recap. There's no doubt that she takes the initiative in this sexual relationship just as much as he does. There's no hint of a kind of little woman or a woman repressed or downtrodden. And against the backdrop of sexual repression that we have in our culture, the cheapening of sex, its commodification... Here we find a woman absolutely confident in her femininity and on the front foot in this relationship in a way which I think we in our culture find almost a little bit unnerving. And it's there from the get-go. So chapter 1, verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. But then chapter 3, verse 1, I sought him in my bed at night. And then part 5, verse 6, don't bother turning to all of these, I sought him, and then even in the consummation itself, blow upon my garden, let my blood come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. She's taking the initiative. And yet he isn't browbeaten or passive either. 
Chapter two, verse eight, behold, he comes leaping over the mountains. I love that description of the bloke. I mean, you may not be a great athlete, but you can get the idea, can't you? He's a gazelle, he's a stag on the mountain. There's this, he's taking the initiative, arise, my love, my beautiful one, come away. So the initiative in love seems to be very much shared, and I wonder if this challenges slightly our understanding of love and of who makes the first move. In a, in a church that tries to teach male, female roles, even with, within marriage, within the church, you know, maybe we allow that in this area to make us kind of quaintly Victorian. She seems to take the initiative a great deal. There's certainly mutual admiration, and it isn't simply physical. He says to her, turn away from me. Your eyes overwhelm me. You've captivated my heart. He's almost in awe of her. Those married men, you know, I hope you have that sort of respect, deep admiration for your wife. She says to him, you whom my soul loves, my beloved. She describes him as my beloved, my friend. Initiative shared, mutual admiration. It's absolutely consensual. Let my beloved come to his garden. There I'll give you my love, which I've laid up for you. There's no hint of coercion or manipulation whatsoever in any of the sexual love that is celebrated in this poem. Let me say it again. There is no hint of co coercion or manipulation. She doesn't use her sexuality to manipulate him in any way. He doesn't coerce her. So in the marital bed, there is to be no coercion, no manipulation. There is such a thing in the Bible as ungodly sex, wrong sex, even within marriage. Read Romans 1, 24 to 27. You may have heard it put about, and it has been very publicly, that a married woman has a duty to provide sexual pleasure for her husband at whatever point he demands and in whatever way he demands. No, absolutely not. There are responsibilities in marriage to serve one's partner for the man and the woman, and a couple's bodies belong to one another in a marriage partnership. And husbands and wives are to find out how to be others-centered in their approach to sexual love. But there is never, ever to be coercion or manipulation, sex on demand, in the marital bed. And then the celebrated love is absolutely exclusive. This is one man and one woman, and it's repeated all the way through the poem, and that's the only thing that is celebrated in the poem. We looked at it briefly last week, but the woman doesn't appear to have sex with Solomon at all. The lover says of his beloved that she is a garden locked up, a spring locked, a fountain sealed, and she says of herself, I was a wall. She did enclose herself with boards of cedar. That's metaphorical, by the way. And in this physical union, it's just her and him. She is his bride, he is her husband. The union is celebrated publicly by the community, but this is a biblical marriage between one man and one woman till death us do part with no intrusion. It's entirely exclusive. So chapter 4, verse 12, a garden locked up is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Chapter 6, verse 3, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, she says. And then look at 6, 8. Do look at that one. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. You can keep that because my dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother pure to her who bore her. So what this poem is doing is reinstating biblical marriage and biblical love. That's what it's doing right at the center of it in this exclusive, mutual admiration, consensual, passionate relationship. And what is so striking is that there's such peace and contentment within it. 
My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the bed of spices, to graze in the garden and to gather lilies. I am my beloved, so my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. After all the kind of high passion, you then have peace, contentment. It's beautiful. So this poem is a restatement of the perfect ideal of marriage and of sexual pleasure and union within an exclusive union between one man and one woman in lifelong partnership. It's a celebration of love. And after the idolatry and sexual immorality of Solomon, who, if you like, is seen in one way as the peak of Israel's life, yet was sexually all over the place, And so after the idolatry and sexual immorality of Solomon and those who followed him, it's as if this poem is teaching Israel how to love again. What is love? It's like it's pressing the reset. It's like it's going all the way back to Genesis 2. And the author's aim is for us to comprehend love, to enjoy love, to benefit from love, As a whole community, whether we're married or not, whether we have this sort of sexual union or not, to recognize it for what it is, a wonderful gift of God, so that we are then ready to be loved genuinely by the only one who can love us absolutely. That's what this poem, I would suggest, is doing. And so much for the first reading with the consummation and the physical consummation of the wedding there at the centerpiece, chapter 4, 1 through to 5, 1. Trouble is, as you read the poem, and I've now read it sort of between 40 and 50 times, I've slightly lost count. As you read the poem, the more you read it, there is something just disturbing. That's why I say it is a subversive poem, because it undermines and questions our understanding of love. It's as if our author is wanting to remind us of the failures of Solomon's version of love with his harem and his 700 wives and 300 concubines. Kind of hold it in front of our face, even as it upholds what the Bible thinks love really should be. And let me say, that then has a huge amount to say to us in 2022, where we are so completely at sea when it comes to love. We just don't understand it in our culture. So I want to move then from the power of love to the pain of love. And I hope you've got the handout there in front of you. And you'll see that I put love there in inverted commas, because this is what the world might call love, but it's certainly not what the Bible would recognize as love. And I hope you might talk to your friends who aren't Christians. You know, when they have a breakup of a relationship, this is the ideal time. Say, well, have you read the Song of Songs? Shall we read it together? Now, in a sense, we hardly need the Bible to tell us that love can be painful. Read your news feeds. Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. A couple of weekends ago, I got all the newspapers I could lay my hands on and just went through and made a list of the different kind of disastrous love situations. That's even before you get to the kind of agony columns. There was an article on Paul Hollywood, How Bake Off Cost Me My Marriage. No, lust cost you your marriage. An article on Stella Creasy and sexual encounters at university and how awful some of them had been and any number of others. And then you think think of your playlist, you know, love in the dark, I can't love you in the dark, it feels like we're oceans apart, the pain of love. Sorry seems to be the hardest word, pain of love. You have no right to ask me how I feel, such a desperately sad song, probably never heard of it, Phil Collins. (laughs) When music was music, no, no, no. But then, of course, you don't just need your playlist and you don't just need the the, the news feeds. Rewind your own backstory. And if you're anything like me. But as we read and reread this poem, at least four themes of pain emerge. And I put a couple of them in inverted commas. Uh, Oh, no, I haven't. Well, I should have done. 
Okay, the first one is the difficulty of love, uh, where um, we're talking about just even the good love here, there's aspects of difficulty to it, and it's complex. Chapter 3 begins with the beloved on her bed. I think it's a dream. I actually think it's probably something of a nightmare. And I think it's the night before the wedding itself. And even just as you read it, there's anxiety, isn't there? I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I'll rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I'll seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but I found him not. The watchman found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen who my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him who my soul loves. You, feel, you can always feel the anxious state of concern. And that anxious, stressful aspect of love is found in the dream both before the marriage and after the marriage. Look at chapter 5, verse 2, following. I mean, she describes the sexual act in verse 5 and 6, and then uh, verse, the second half of verse 6, My soul failed me when I spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. He was there, he's gone. He's there, he's gone. Anxiety and stress. Now, once you notice that, <clears throat> it appears to be pretty much everywhere in the poem, it keeps coming up. Chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 is really interesting, so turn the page. <clears throat> now, with the marriage consummated after the second dream, then we're asked to think about the, 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 the lover <clears throat> and, um, and the beloved and each of the characters. But look at verse 12. Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsmen. She's down in the stables amongst the charioteers. And... Um, they say to her, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. You see, all these blokes are there, and here she is amongst the charioteers. It's like being in the changing room after the rugby match or something like that. And all the lads are there. And then verse 13, why sh he replies, her lover, why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? How beautiful are your feet. And they, then he goes, in other words, he's a great defender, a protector. Even as she is admired, lustfully by the blokes. And so I think the point to take from this, and it's all over the place, even at the beginning where she says, you know, my vineyard I have not kept. I think she's saying, I didn't attend to the one true love of my life and it seems to have slipped through my fingers. Oh, come to me, come to me. And I should have paid more attention to it. I think the point we're meant to be getting is that love is just very difficult and complex. And somebody said to me after the four o'clock, well, you know, what more can you say to that? And I don't think I can say much more than that other than it just seems to be complex and difficult. Of course, because it's kind of so emotive, isn't it? And here's just an observation. You know, I was uh, the first talk on sex and marriage I attended in St. Helens was in 1985. Okay? And then I used to do Luke's job here uh, in 1995, and we had other talks on sex and marriage. And again, in sort of 2005, I suppose, I can't remember, probably 2015. And here we are in 2022. And my observation is actually every issue that people have talked to me about is exactly the same as it was in 1985. Nothing's changed. In fact, when Janet and I got together, I know you're not at all interested in this particular love story, but you know, when we got together, it was extraordinarily, it was incredibly complex. I admired her from far, but I was far too proud to do anything about it in case she said no. I didn't want to have my pride damaged, and she claims to have admired me from afar, but I think that was entire revisionism. She's looked back and rewritten history. I, she even knew I was at that time, but anyway, there we go. This was all going on, you know, and then actually us getting together. I'm not going to go into it now, but it was incredibly complex. And I have to say, at least one other person got the wrong end of the stick in the whole process. And in a degree, it was painful. And I'm not saying that to say, you know, well, we should just lump it. It's just to say it is complex. And we know that. So love is difficult. I don't think I can say much more than that. 
But then, in inverted commas, love can be dangerous. It really can be abusive. And we've spoken about the looming threat when she was among the charioteers in chapter 6. But just have a look at the second nightmare on the other side of the consummation scene and verses 5 and 6. So she describes, looking back on the sexual act, I arose to open to my beloved. We're in chapter 5, verse 5. I arose to open to my beloved, my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchman found me. As they went about in the city, they beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. Now, what does that describe? I mean, Stella Creasy in her article in the broadsheets describes how she was surrounded by a group of lads who thought it was a joke to talk about abusing her. And the danger of love is hinted at much earlier in the poem as well. I don't know if you remember when we were reading chapter two, you know, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. You say to yourself, I thought this was a love poem. The little foxes that spoil the vineyard. So it seems that her beloved is to come to her and to protect her from the dangerous love, the foxes that might ruin, the charioteers, The lover to whom she, the beloved, flees is a protector and a guardian and a place of security. She takes him to her mother's home, which is a place of security and peace. And in a congregation of this size, I'm so sad to say, inevitably, there will be some, through absolutely no fault of your own, for whom even mentioning this kind of abusive love is very painful indeed. You may have been subject to sexual abuse of some sort. And inevitably, there will be others who look back on sexual behavior of one sort or another and find ourselves deeply ashamed. And in the case of abusive sex, I do think it important to say that we should report it that as we do so, it's taken with utmost seriousness by an outstanding team who treat you with respect and care. And that if we're a perpetrator of this kind of so-called love, in inverted commas, then we need to repent of it, turn from it, confess it. The pain of love, it can be just so difficult. The pain of love, there's such a thing as dangerous love. There's also damaging, and again, love in inverted commas, what the world actually would boast about is profoundly damaging. That is multiple and unrestrained sexual encounters in Solomon's harem that the daughters of Jerusalem, I think, idolize. They rather wish they were in the harem. They find it rather glamorous. But that the woman in the poem is warning them vigorously against. Now, that damaging love is most obvious at the end of the poem. We glanced at it last week. Turn to chapter 8 and verse 10. She says... Yet I was a wall. My breasts were like towers, and I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. And then she talks about Solomon. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal. Baal was the god of fertility, at Baal Hammon. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. (laughs) But, verse 12, my vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand. You can keep it. And the keepers of the fruit, 200. 
Now, you can see the point, can't you? This poem is asking us to consider the ugliness of sex outside marriage. How ugly it is. Damaging. And unpleasant. Ultimately. My suggestion is that this is actually all the way through. We've already looked at chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, where... um, Uh, He says, you know, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one is the only one. You can see the contrast, can't you? And what I've done is I've drawn a table for you on the handout there that charts the three times that she says, I plead with you, do not awaken love until it so desires. The first time comes in the context of his left hand is under my head and his right hand caresses me. And then she says, I adjure you, do not awaken. The third time, his left hand is under my head and his right hand caresses me. It's a deliberate repetition. I plead with you, do not awaken love. This is so important, so good within an exclusive relationship. Just don't awaken it. And in 8 verse 5, she says, who is this coming up out of the wilderness? And it's her beloved. But in chapter 3, when we have another, I plead with you, do not awaken you, awaken love until it so desires, we have, who is this coming out of the wilderness? And it's Solomon. You could read it as a positive description of Solomon coming up out of the wilderness. I don't think it is. I'm happy for you to disagree with me and you know, we're not going to fall out over it. But it's a description of his marriage bed more than it is of a kind of wedding chariot. And it has to be guarded by 60 warriors and is decorated by the daughters of Jerusalem. And I think it's as if she's saying in her nightmare, look at this marriage bed with the bedroom that's had... Sexual conquest after sexual conquest after sexual conquest after sexual conquest. And it's it's kind of just a wilderness. And then at the end of the poem, who is this coming out of the wilderness? It's my lover. His left hand, his right hand. He is mine and I am his. And it's entirely positive. So it does seem, I mean, I don't think you can get away from this, whatever you make of the Solomon chapter 3, verse 6 piece, it does seem that the poem as a whole is asking us to ponder the ugly, damaging nature of sex outside of an exclusive, mutual, consensual union of marriage. Solomon was a, a womanizing idolater. Women led him to more and more idolatry. Idolatry led him to more and more women. The two fed one another. And this kind of cheapening and devaluing of sex is precisely the opposite of genuine love. How the world can call it love is beyond me. As a culture moves away from the God of the Bible with his desire for an exclusive, intimate, faithful, deeply loving relationship with his people... So a culture moves further and further away from a true understanding of sex and love, and it begins with just a cheap, plastic imitation. Sex is a good gift from God. It's designed as a final act of intimacy and a wholly consensual, binding, mutually respectful relationship between one man and one woman in the safety of a lifelong commitment And in such a context of trust and constancy and protection and care, you can expose yourself and make yourself vulnerable. Of course you can. But outside of that safe context, well, sex is going to be damaging because you cannot take the intimate bonding act between one man and one woman, rip it apart, glue it back together again in another context, and then rip it apart, and then glue it back together again, and then rip it apart, and then glue it back together again. And that explains the crazy contradiction of Hollywood. Holding sex up as the ultimate expression of love, 
commercializing and industrializing sex. And we have a far, far better view. We, Hollywood prizes sex, yet cheapens sex, idolizes sex, and objectifies women. Hollywood is profoundly abusive towards women. It causes immense and intense damaging to men and women as we take something that is so precious and is designed to be held as precious and just cheapens it. And this is where our government is too cowardly to do anything about it in its sex education. Well, it's too blind, it can't see. It's led anyway by a serial adulterer. And this is where social opinion formers have got things so profoundly wrong. Oh, just stick on a condom and it'll be safe sex. No. Well, you may have experienced this, the damage, this sort of damage. And whilst what you may have experienced may not have been illegal, as under the previous heading of dangerous sex, it may nonetheless and will have been profoundly damaging. And once again, I want to encourage you, please, to talk with somebody about that if you would find this helpful. As I regularly say, there's no such thing as a sexually pure person in this building. Every person in this building is a failure when it comes to sex. But actually to find somebody who you can talk to and pray with about it might be profoundly helpful, ideally within your small group or the small group setting. But then there are plenty of others around who would be very happy to speak with you. Maybe Jess or Luke and Abby or Nick. Sarah Adamson isn't here this evening, but she will be around. Anna and so forth. Let me just say something very briefly about pornography in this context. Not only is pornography an objectification of men and women, which undermines their humanity, it also damages the person who views pornography by making what is designed to be other-centered all about me. That's why pornography is such a wretched thing, because sex is designed to be other person-centered, to give pleasure to, to love the other person. And it's meant to be, obviously, two people of opposite sex. But pornography is just about me and an objective, objectified image of a woman. It's profoundly selfish. Deeply damaging. Finally, even what you might call ideal marital love is not ultimately fulfilling. I, I wonder if you've noticed, we're just about done now, so just briefly turn to the end of chapter 8, would you? Have you noticed, I mean, if you were writing the end to this poem, how would it go? Well, you know, if I was writing, it would be kind of Notting Hill moment, you know, Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts, or, or Crocodile Dundee, you know, they'd be down in the underground, I love you! Shrek. Ah, oh, Fiona, yes, Shrek, I love you. Really, but I'm supposed to be beautiful. But you are beautiful. I love you. <laughs> Ugly ever after. But it just doesn't finish there. Oh, you who dwell in the garden with companions, listening for your voice, let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. It's kind of, you've got to start all over again. It hasn't ultimately satisfied. It, it, it's great, but it, it's, not, it's not everything. Even human marriage isn't where it's all supposed to end. Even within marriage, there can be great complications. Even where there aren't great complications, sexual union doesn't ultimately provide final satisfaction. And all the way through the poem, remember, it's not just the couple, but there are the others as well. And that's why you've got to come back next week.
because uh, next week we're going to see where this whole poem points. Uh, immensely painful. It's difficult, dangerous, damaging, even disappointing. But this poem points us to seek one who is not like Solomon, who is pure, who seeks an exclusive union, who is not an idolater, who is selfless in his pursuit, who can be trusted absolutely, who protects and provides and purifies. And I mentioned this last week, but isn't it striking that when you come to John's Gospel, you first meet Jesus in the main narrative in chapter 2 at a wedding feast. And within no time, he's with the woman at the well who's had five husbands and the man she's currently with she's not married to. And he says to the woman at the well, whoever drinks of the water I will give will never be thirsty again. So Jesus is the true bridegroom. He does wash his bride and give her white robes to wear. And as we close, as we talked about some very painful things, it's worth reminding one another that he bought us with the price of his blood. And when he bought us, he knew what he was buying. He knew what he was purchasing when he bought you. Let's pray together. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. We praise you, our Father, for the cleansing that is to be found in Jesus Christ. And with all the complexity and pain and difficulty and damage, the abuse that we see around us, we praise and thank you, our Father in heaven, that in Jesus we have one who loves us perfectly, who can guard us and protect us absolutely who cleanses us and who genuinely satisfies. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.